Good morning. As we celebrate and as we have our prayer and fasting week, you know, first we would like to thank many, many people who helped first produce this prayer and fasting handbook. Uh, we have to thank the prayer committee and the discipleship committee who help us with the thoughts and the, the format and then the printing. Uh, we are very thankful to God that in our church we have very good printers. So they gave the church a very good price and printed it for the benefit of each one of us. We also thank our pastor and our pastoral staff for all their cooperation in introducing and encouraging each one of us to join the prayer and fasting week. For the last 10 years, we have discovered that many of our members, though they receive the prayer handbook, do not really read it. That is why today our message will be divided into two parts. The first part is the message that I would like to give to encourage you and to give some of the Bible verses for our edification. But this will just be short because we would also like to take the time to introduce this book. So, today we want to make sure that each one of you knows what is in this book. So that all the effort, I would say more than 100 hours spent in producing this book will not come to waste. Oswald Chamber said, God will never reveal more truth about himself till you obey what you know already. God's word will be useless to you if you have not decided in your heart to follow his instructions. In other words, God has so much wisdom and treasures in the book, but he will not give it to you if your heart is not ready or if you have not decided that you want to follow him. So this morning I pray that you will come with an open heart and with an open mind to listen to what God is going to say to you. This year we have chosen the book of First Peter written by the great apostle Peter. We discovered that Peter had many obvious faults. But when he experienced how God had helped him, he wrote down his experience. So this book is very applicable and helpful to us. For example, Peter was an impulsive guy. He reacts very fast and he would just say things very fast. For example, one day he told Jesus, Oh Jesus, <clears throat> you are going to die for us? May that not be. And what did Jesus say? Away from me, Satan, because you do not value the idea, the will of God, but you are only thinking of man's idea. So, when you read this book, you will discover Peter kept on increasing and keep on emphasizing we must be clear-minded we must be alert and self-controlled and then he said we must spend time thinking what God is saying so that we do not easily make mistakes so we learned that Peter was learning from his weakness example, another weakness of Peter that is very obvious <clears throat> he was proud but notice in 1st Peter the great apostle said, Therefore, humble yourself before God. Because the Bible says, God opposes the proud, but helps and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, so that in due time, <clears throat> He will lift you up. We also find another witness of Peter. Three times, 
he denied Christ. He was ashamed of Christ. But notice as we study First Peter. He said, if you suffer as a Christian, you must rejoice and praise God because you bear the name. Do not be ashamed. So we notice that from the weakness of Peter, he learned his mistake and he offered suggestion and encouragement to overcome those weakness. This morning, this is how we would like to do it. We will just briefly enumerate from 1 Peter the five callings of God and the two commands that each one of us must follow. Now, I know that many times people, and especially in seminary, said you can only get a few points because people cannot absorb and cannot retain if you give more than three points. This morning, we will only have three major points, but we have several sub points. But I always challenge these people and say, our generation today and hundreds of years ago are so different. Before, they had no audiovisual aid to help them. So they only listen to the speaker. And so when they listen long, they get tired. They don't know what the speaker is talking about. But today, with the advent of technology, we have audio visual. And we can look at the words, listen to the words, and so we can absorb more. Then, we also would like, at the end, offer three reasons why we must pray and fast. You know, I've heard many people tell me, even my own son. My son yesterday told me, Dad, why do we need to have prayer and fasting? He says, I don't exactly know why. And he says, I feel as if it becomes a ritual. We are just doing it because we like to have prayer and fasting. And I said, no, no, that's totally not correct. That is why I decided our message today. There will only be a short message, but we will spend a little time looking at this book. Because in this book, we have listed many of the reasons, the purposes of why we fast. We also have listed in this book, how do we go about fasting? What are the objectives? And how do we go about finishing our fast and going back to normal? So let's now go to some of the callings of God to us and the commands. There are five callings and two commands. The first calling of God is that you are called by God out of darkness into His light. All the Bible references are in this prayer handbook and so it is not in our visualing. You and I were dead in sin and trespasses. But God in His great mercy rescued us from darkness into His wonderful light. From a life of sinful desires, God rescued us and gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you look at the book, there are further explanation and exposition of the verses. Today, I am just giving you the overview. So don't say, how come you only spoke so little about this point? Because the bulk are here. In our pulpit, we are only sharing 20% of what is here. The 80% is up to you. If you spend time this week reading this, you will get the 80%. If you don't, I'm sorry, you will only have learn 20% of what God wants you to learn. A second calling. You are called by God to holiness. Peter said, since the one who called you is holy, you must be holy. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. If you do not live or try to live a holy life, even though we say no one can ever be perfectly holy. 
But at least you must try. And you must trust the Lord to help you to live a holy life. To put away sins that will hinder you from listening and from knowing God's will for your life. There is a third calling. You are called by God to suffer for Him. When Peter was young, he was afraid of suffering. But as he grew more mature, and as he saw the resurrection of Christ, Peter understood that each one of us as a Christian, we are also called by God to suffer. I remember many, many years ago, when I saw one of the motto of Biblical Seminary of the Philippines, and it says, we must suffer for Christ. I was saying to myself, that is a very bad motto, because the leaders are telling the seminarians, you know, they should be suffering. I say, how could that be the Christian life to suffer for God? But today, I realize suffering is part of our life. And if you want to know more about that, please read this book. There is a fourth calling. You are called by God to inherit a blessing. Peter advises us, do not pay back insult with insult, evil with evil, but blessing, so that you will inherit a blessing. You know, God called us to do good, not to harm others, not to curse others, but to bless them, so that we in turn will be rewarded by God with blessing. Now we first go into the command that we will also be emphasizing today. You are commanded by God to witness and you are commanded by God to serve. The command to witness is this. Peter encouraged all the Christians. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a reason to everyone who asks you for the reason that you have. You know, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a good conscience. We are also commanded by God to serve. Peter said, the end of all things is near, and therefore you must be clear-minded and self-control so that you can pray. Each one should use the gift that he has received to serve others. Notice, we receive gifts from God to serve others. God did not give us gifts to become selfish and benefit ourselves. But God wants us to use these gifts to serve others, to do good to others. And then, finally, you are called by God to His eternal glory in Christ. Peter had many faults, but there is one thing he has learned. He listened carefully to Jesus Christ. He witnessed what Christ has done, he listened to His teaching, and he discovered one insight. Previously, he had sinned against God, but Jesus Christ restored him. And so Peter said, The God of all grace, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and strengthen you firm and steadfast. When Peter realized that when he denied Christ three times, he was like a fallen soldier, a fallen disciple, but Jesus gave him a chance. And when Jesus restored him, Peter also used that to encourage each one of us. Do not be discouraged, because God himself, Jesus Christ himself, will restore you. And so there is hope. When you fall and when you sin against God, don't worry. God himself will restore you because He is the God of all grace. 
command to serve. This is the main thing we would like to share today. But briefly, there are three words that we need to learn under this command to serve. Pray, act, and love. If you remember the acronym TAO, I remembered about 35 years ago when I visited Hong Kong. The tourist guide said, do you know what TAO means? Plain, always late. Today, at Grace Gospel Church, TAO <coughs> means pray, act, and <coughs> love. The reason why Peter said we must pray is because the end is near. William MacDonald said the meaning of this phrase, because the end is near, is that when the millennium ends, there will be the destruction of the earth and the heavens. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. That is what is meant in this phrase. The end is near. But this phrase also emphasizes to us that our time is short. That is why we need to pray. Now in praying, Peter said the first element or the first suggestion is to be clear-minded and self-controlled. The idea is this. When you are being persecuted, when you face trials and storms, what usually happens? You panic, you become distressed, and you become hysterical. So Peter said, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Be serious and watchful in prayer. I never realized before that, wow, this is such a good suggestion. The reason for the way for us to be able to pray intelligently is not to be hysterical, not to be stressed out so easily, but to trust God, you know, to have a mind that is poised and stable, so that we can see clearly and we can intelligently pray to God. Then, there is also this suggestion, you must pray continually. In Genesis chapter 32, we learn and we see the picture of Jacob when he was coming home from Padan Aram. And his man told him, your brother Esau is coming to you with 400 men. The Bible says Jacob became fearful and distressed. He was afraid. Why? Because for 20 years, his guilty conscience had been affecting him greatly because he cheated his brother Esau out of the <coughs> birthright of the firstborn son. And so for 20 years, Jacob lived a life of guilt, a life of fear, a life of being cheated by his own father-in-law. Jacob said for 10 times, Laban, he had changed my wages. So he was paying the price for his mistake. You know, this encourages us. Because when Jacob was returning back to his country, that night he struggled with a man from God. And the Bible said they kept on struggling until they break. And the man said, you must let me go because it is almost daybreak. Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he replied. The man said, you will now no longer be called Jacob. You will now be called Israel because you have wrestled with God and with man and have overcome. The idea is to be persistent and patient and continue praying. That is the lesson we learn. So today, I would also like to suggest to you, do not be discouraged easily, but be persistent in praying.
Charles Spurgeon said this, No man can do me a truer kindness in this world than to pray for me. The thing that each one of us can do is to pray for one another. The second word that I was telling you, ah, okay, let's just uh, review. What's the first word? Pray. Second word, act. Peter said, administer God's grace faithfully. We are stewards of the gift that God has given us. And our responsibility is to be faithful in administering these gifts to serve others. As we help others, we need to be willing. We need to do it willingly without grumbling. Now this is also related to the next point. Take the initiative to walk the extra mile. We are reminded of the story of Rebecca. When the servant of Abraham was ordered by Abraham to go to his home country and find a wife for his son, Isaac. The servant went to Padan Aram. And when he saw Rebecca coming, he prayed to God, God, will you please be kind and show me a favor because of your servant Abraham? And so he prayed to God and he said, God, when I ask Rebecca to give me water, and if, and if she gives me water, and also decides to give water to all my camels, I will know she is the one here to pay. Now notice what Rebecca did. The Bible says when Jacob met Rebecca, and I mean not Jacob, the servant, the servant told her, ah, will you please give me a little water from your jar? The Bible says Rebecca quickly brought down her jar to her hands and gave water to the servant. And without being told, Rebecca said further, I will also get water for all your candles until they have enough to drink. But what do we see here? We saw Rebecca willingly helping someone who needs help. And we saw that she had initiative. The servant never told her, oh, can you also give me water for this candle? Notice there were 10 candles. And all these candles had journeyed a long time. Do you know that water is very heavy? My friend who was a geologist, uh, a doctorate in geologist, told me, do you know that water is so heavy? He says, if you fill the room with water, the half will collapse. Because water is so heavy. Now notice, Rebecca had to carry this water so heavy to provide water for the ten camels. How many trips do you think she had to run to the well to bring the water to give to the camel and then to go back and forth because there are ten camels. Now this shows us Rebecca was willing and at initiative. Today, as we study and as we Pray and fast. May all of us have initiative. Our church has many members who have initiative. For example, when we were building the cross point building, one of our leaders had experience in building factories. So he helped plan and oversee the construction of our cross point building willingly. He was not paid. Nobody told him to do it, but he was willing. Every Sunday after our first Sunday worship, because it's early, many prayer warriors come without eating. But we have a couple who cooks, prepares food for the Sunday prayer warriors. All of these were voluntary work done by our members. So we thank God that in our church we have many members who willingly 
and who take initiative to help. Just look at the answers and look at the people who help us with the offerings. Are they paid for doing it? No. But they willingly do it. And so may we have more people like this who are willing and take initiative to walk the extra mile. The third word and the final word, love. And Peter said, keep on loving one another earnestly, fervently. The idea in the NID uh, <clears throat> version was you love each other deeply. You know, what it means is that you are willing to forego or not to spend too much time complaining about minor faults and failures of people. You do not publicize the mistakes of others because you love them deeply. You want what is good for them. Love covers over a multitude of sins. William MacDonald said, this phrase, love covers over a multitude of sins, does not mean or it is not a doctrine that because you love others, all their sins are forgiven and they are saved. It is not. But what it means is that when you are really loving someone, you go out of your way, you try to help them, and you do what is good for others. But it does not mean that you are saved by love. We, each one of us, are saved by the blood of Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, His blood saved us, cleansed our sins, and that is what saves us, not love. But we are commanded to love. Now, we like to tackle this question. Why pray and fast? The first reason, preparation for service. When Jesus started his ministry at age 30, the Bible says he prayed and fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now just imagine, if even the Son of God, Jesus, spent 40 days and 40 nights before he started his ministry, isn't it wise for us to also spend time to pray and to fast for our year's program? and for the plans we have. A second reason, spiritual power. After Jesus came back from fasting, He returned from Galilee. The Bible says He was filled with power. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So another purpose, another reason why we encourage each one of us to pray and fast is so that we can receive spiritual power. The final reason for our message today is when you are confronting a great crisis. For example, if you are facing a financial meltdown, a financial crisis, your business is collapsing, or you are not making enough, or you are facing a serious illness, cancer, maybe terminal cancer, third stage, fourth stage, or you are facing a life and death situation. When you are confronting a great crisis, pray and fast is a solution. Queen Esther, when faced with a life and death situation, told her uncle Mordecai, ask all the Jews who are living in Susa to spend three days to pray and to fast. And then she said, I and my names will also pray and fast. And then I will go and see the king even if it is against the law. Because if the king doesn't call me, I cannot go see him. That's against the law. The punishment is, if the king doesn't leave his scepter, I die. And so Queen Esther said, if I perish, I perish. Her solution was, let's fast and pray for God's favor. 
Praise God. God favored her. After three days of prayer and fasting, when she went to see the king, the king was gracious to her. And he raised his scepter. So, Queen Esther was spared. And through her, through her prayers, she then told the king of the evil club of Haman. And the Jewish people and Queen Esther was saved. Because Queen Esther was willing to pray and fast. We have this acronym, PAL, P-A-L. If we say together the three words, pray, act, love. So please don't forget. We just remember PAL, P-A-L, pray, act, and fast. That ends our message. Now, will each one of you please take your prayer handbook? I would like to just spend a few minutes to introduce what is here. Look at the inside front cover. It tells us right from the beginning what is important. Prayer and fasting is defined as voluntarily going without food for a specified duration of time in order to focus on prayer and fellowship with God. It is dedicating yourself to fully relying on God for the strength, provision, and wisdom they need, that you need. Prayer. In prayer, we converse and commune with God, listening to Him for the purpose of aligning our will and heart to Him. Fasting. In fasting, we express remorse and repentance from sin and submit to the Holy Spirit's work in breaking the bandages and sin in our lives. If you look at page 1, this page explains the joint project of the prayer committee and the discipleship committee and the purpose and the theme for this year. Now look at page 2. You will see that on day 1, that is tomorrow, day 1, we begin the devotional. You are called by God out of darkness into light. When you read it, you will understand more what those Bible verses mean. Look at the right side. Discovery Bible study. Now here it says, write out the passage below. Write the passage in your own words. What does it say about God? What does it say about your identity? What does it say about man? What will I do in response? When you take time answering these questions, I guarantee you, after these seven days of devotion, you will discover, wow, I never knew that there are so much gems and treasures in the Bible. You will be glad you did. That's why I challenge you, please, take time this week. At least 15 minutes a day. Better half an hour to an hour. Just answer those questions. Try your best. Even your, if your answers are not ideal, it's okay. Nobody will look at it. It's only for you and God. Look at the day, day two. Tuesday, you are called by God to holiness. The third day, you are called by God to suffer for Him. Fourth day, you are called by God to inherit the blessing. The fifth day on page 10, you are commanded by God to witness. Day 6, you are commanded by God to serve. We elaborated on this day 6 today. And then day 7, you are called by God to His eternal glory in Christ. Now turn to page 16. You will see here, using the discovery Bible study. You know, you can read it yourself. I know you are intelligent, so I don't need to explain to you how that is done. Now look at page 17. It's fasting for you. This article written by Jim and Courtney Hawkins gives us four kinds of people who need to fast. Fasting is for people with needs. The next page. Fasting is for people struggling with unbelief. Page 18. 
Number three, fasting is for people who need a breakthrough. And then, the fourth type of people, fasting is for people that need consistency in their relationship with Jesus. Now turn to page 20. This article is written in Chinese, but the English version was written by Donald Whitney. And there are 10 purposes for prayer and fast. Now just to briefly mention them in English, in case you do not know how to read Chinese. Okay? If you know how to read Chinese, well and good. But if you do not know, let me just say in English what those 10 purposes are. So just in short, the first reason is to have prayer power. Number two is to ask God for guidance. Number three, it is to express your sorrow. Number four, it is to have security and breakthrough from bandages. Number five, it is to repent of your sin and return to God. Number six, it is to express your humility before God. Number seven, it is to be concerned with the work of God. Number eight, it is to help others who have needs. Number nine, it is to overcome temptation and to offer yourself to God. And number ten, to me, one of the most important reasons why and the purpose for fasting. Because this express your devotion and worship to God. So if someone asks you, uh, mom or dad, why should I fast? Tell your daughter and your son. One of the reasons is to express your devotion and worship to God. Now turn to page 24. Preparing to fast. As you begin to spend time to fast, first important thought, set your objective and commit to a type of fast. Are you going to not eat for one day or two days or three days or one week? Are you going to do partial fasting? That means you will only eat maybe vegetables or only eat fruits or you will feed it meat but you, you commit to at least reduce by 50% or by 75%. It's up to you. This is voluntary and no one is forcing you. Number two, we should be expectant. You must fast by faith. In my experience, when time of prayer and fasting comes, I discovered that by God's grace, I can go without food for that period of time. But under ordinary times, I really feel so hungry and I tell myself, I don't think I can fast. But once I determine I'm going to fast, or for example this week, when we have prayer and fasting, I discover for unknown reason to me, God enables us to be able to fast. Now you, you will only know it if you try. It's like when God told the Israelites, you cross the Red Sea. They will never know if they can cross it until they step on the water. You will never know the meaning of prayer and fasting until you determine first you want to do it and you determine the kind of fasting you want and you go ahead and do it. I'm just telling you, the first meal for example, usually you should begin the night before because the day starts at night. So 6 o'clock at night. For example, if you want to start fasting tomorrow, you start tonight 6 o'clock. So you, let's say you only want juice. So tonight you only drink juice. Now tonight until tomorrow, that will be the hardest because your stomach is still used to eating. And so when you start fasting, you just know, okay, it's a little hard. but this will pass. And you will be surprised after a few hours that half your pain is gone and you have succeeded. So the next day, you can continue to fast. 
Number three, prepare yourself spiritually. You choose a place, silent place, where you can pray. Prepare yourself physically. Number five, lessen physical activities. And number six, be in faith. Now during the fast on page 25, this is what you want to do. You want to seek the Lord, you commit to change, to be transformed, and to obey what God tells you. Number three, you pray for suggested items given by our pastors and our pastoral staff. Number four, you saturate your mind with the Word of God. While you are fasting, you may think, what am I going to do? And you are not supposed to just daydream. You are supposed to read God's Word, saturate your mind with the Word of God. Spend some time reading God's Word, spend some time praying, spend some, some time just quietly listening to God. And then put yourself on a schedule. And then you go to page 26, breaking the fast. You end your fast gradually. For example, if you have been fasting with just fruit juices for six days, now on the seventh day, of course, you will still feel hungry. Now don't suddenly go, for example, to the Vikings buffet and suddenly eat as much as you can. I guarantee you, you will get sick. Because your stomach is not used to digesting so much food. Because for four or for six to seven days, you have been fasting. So you cannot suddenly eat buffet the next meal. You start with soup or fruits or vegetables, just like or porridge. And then after one or two meals, your stomach gets to its usual rhythm and then you begin to eat more. Number two, continue to pray. It doesn't mean that after prayer and fasting, after the week is over, you will stop praying. Number three, expect greater intimacy with God. Number four, experience the joy of God's presence. On page 27, my prayer list for the week. For these several days, you can list down your prayer items. And when God answers them, you can check them. Because that will encourage you. <clears throat> now look at page 29. My prayer and fasting schedule. From Monday to Sunday, you can check whichever one you want. Water fast, liquid fast, eat one meal only, two meals, three meals, one day, two days. And then, if you look at the right side, there is joint evening prayer at night. Every day, 7.30 to 8.30 from tomorrow night, Monday to Friday. Now, I so urge you, if you have time or if you live nearby, please attend the prayer meeting. You will be glad <clears throat> that you partake and that you participate in our church prayer fast. Now, look at page 32. We have a prayer room. By Saturday next week, 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, there will be three hours of prayer and there will be a dedication of the prayer room. Pastor Raymond Chan and his wife Beth will help lead that three hours of prayer and also the dedication of that prayer room. If you look on the next page, the inside back over, it just reminds us there was a prayer covenant many, many years ago signed by our leaders that we will spend time praying and fasting. Okay, I to thank all of you for patiently listening and going through this prayer and fasting book. I pray that this year there will be a difference, that at least 25% of our members will undertake some kind of fasting. 25% of our members will mean out of 500, 125. Do you think we can achieve it? I think we can, because uh, out of 500, I don't think it is hard to have 125 people who will spend some time praying and fasting in one way or the other. So can we pray that you will be one of those? Now, if we can exceed 25%, hallelujah, we thank God. Next year, we pray that we will improve 
my brother's church, CCF. Some of the members told me. I was surprised. They, they said, you know, when we heard about this prayer and fasting, at first we were reluctant and we were skeptical. He said, but after persuasion, after eloquent reasons given, they said they tried it. And they find it very beneficial and helpful. And so this morning I like to challenge all of you. If you have never tried praying and fasting before God for a specified period of time, why don't you try this year? No, I can guarantee you in my life. I can guarantee you with everything I have. You will be glad you did. You will not be glad. Just remember, God expects us to fast. In the Bible, it never said, it's a suggestion. The Bible says, when you fast, this is how you must fast. So the Bible, as written by God's people, expects us, and God expects us, to spend time fasting. Because it is one of the disciplines that every Christian should learn to have. Because of its tremendous benefit to anyone who tries it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your graciousness. Thank you for teaching us, Lord, as we face this challenge of praying and fasting. We are aware that Satan is very hard at work to stop us, to obstruct us, to give us reasons why we should not pray and fast. But Lord, we know that this is your will. And so we'd like to pray in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son, to pray because of the blood of Christ shed on the cross, because of your tremendous suffering, because of the enormous price you paid to save us, that for once we will take time to listen and to obey your leading and that we will spend some time by faith to embark on prayer and fasting not because we want to become rich or because we think that by praying and fasting we can force you to do certain things but Lord because you are our master and you are deserving of all the praise, glory, and exaltation that we can offer you. So Lord, it's an expression of our devotion and worship. Please help us. May your Holy Spirit prompt us, convict us to try praying and fasting. And may Jesus Christ, in His graciousness, enable us to do it. And may God the Father who is great in mercy. Favor us with your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.